too. Rolle's theorem and the mean value theorem. Now you'll see that these are just kind of applications of the intermediate value theorem that we've already done, so uh, nothing too overly complicated, I don't think. But we, we do want to understand and be able to use Rolle's theorem and the mean value theorem. So Rolle's theorem, we're going to start with the extreme value theorem that states that a continuous function on a closed interval has to have a maximum and a minimum. Okay, any function, as long as it's continuous, has to have a high point and a low point. That makes sense. Even if it's straight, you know, you still, every point is a high point and a low point. They're both, you know, that. So it doesn't matter. As long as it's got a closed interval, then we know, and it's continuous. However, it can happen that those values occur at the endpoints, right? Say a straight line. The maximum is going to be at this endpoint. The minimum is going to be at this endpoint. So it can happen that way. But Rolle's theorem, uh, which is named after Michel Rolle, gives conditions that guarantee the existence of some extreme value inside of the interval, not necessarily at the endpoints. What it says is, if we let a function be continuous on a closed interval from A to B, okay, as long as it's differentiable on the open interval from A to B, if f of A is equal to f of B, so if the y value at the endpoints are the same, okay, then that guarantees that somewhere inside of that interval there's a C, you know, between A and B, where the first derivative is equal to zero. Okay? And what happens at the first derivative being zero? We talked about this last time. That gives us that horizontal tangency, which means we have a maximum or a minimum. So really all we're saying is that if the Y value on the endpoints are the same, then there has to be a maximum or a minimum somewhere between them. Okay? Does that make sense? We'll see a picture of it. f of a and f of b are the same value, right? d. If those values are the same, and we're talking about a continuous function that's differentiable, then we know that somewhere between them, whether it goes up, down, you know, whatever, there has to be at least one point in there where we have that peak or valley. Now, even if it's not differentiable, if we drop that requirement from Rolle's theorem, then we'll still have a critical number somewhere in that open interval from A to B, but it may not yield that horizontal tangent line, right? We, we know that only happens at a differentiable point. Not a big deal, but it, it can happen that you still have that relative maximum and minimum because you have that critical value, okay? So remember, what's the difference between the derivative equaling zero and a critical value? Anybody remember? If I were to ask you, are they the same? Are they different? Well, we know they're different, right? Because we just saw that here we have the first derivative equals zero. That means we have a horizontal tangent line. Here we have no horizontal tangent line. We just have a critical number. So we can have critical numbers without having the first derivative equal to zero. That's where the first derivative is undefined. Remember, our critical numbers are anywhere where our first derivative equals zero or if the first derivative is undefined, okay? So that's what happens here. So if we want to find two x-intercepts of this function and then show that there's a derivative equal to zero somewhere between the two of them. So if we want to do this, the first thing we have to do is solve for the x-intercepts. Thank you. So how do we find the x-intercepts of a function? Do what? Yeah, well, what do you have to do before you factor it? Well, you have to set it equal to zero, right? Because that's kind of what happens at the x-intercepts, y equals zero. So we set it equal to zero, then we factor it and solve each one for, for uh, zero independently. So we want to note that f is differentiable on the entire number line, so we know that we can do this. Setting f of x equal to 0 gives us x squared minus 3x plus 2 equals 0. So how is that going to factor out? Yeah, yeah. x minus 1, x minus 2 equals 0. And then that means that we're going to set each one of those equal to 0, right, by the principle of 0 products. So we get x equals what? x equals 1 and x equals 2. So that gives us the two points that are basically the endpoints that we're going to use Rolle's theorem on. So we know that somewhere between 1 and 2, 
there has to be a maximum or a minimum because those two values are the same, right? They're both x-intercepts, so they both have the same y value equals zero. So somewhere between there, between one and two, there has to be the first derivative equal to zero. So if we know that, we need to take the first derivative, right? So if we take the first derivative, we get that 2x minus 3 is the first derivative. We want to set that equal to 0, and we can see that when we set that equal to 0, we add 3 to both sides, divide by 2, we get 3 halves. So we can see that there is a value between 1 and 2 that has a maximum or a minimum. Okay? Now whether it is a maximum or a minimum, we don't necessarily know. We just know that it's there and that it is, you know, a peak or a valley. We'll talk about how to determine whether it's a maximum or a minimum in just a little bit. But does everybody see how we use Rolle's theorem here to verify that there was some peak or valley in there? Okay. So this is what that graph actually looks like. We can see that Bop, bop, bop. And we could have figured this out with cal or with uh, pre-cal, right? We could have done find the vertex, and we would know where the minimum point is because it's a quadratic equation. But now we're going to use calculus to make it a little bit more elegant. Now the mean value theorem we don't use very often. It's not a huge part of calculus, but it is important to talk about it. And basically, we're going to use Rolle's theorem to prove this. What we're going to say is that if f is continuous on the, that closed interval from a to b, and it's differentiable on the open interval from a to b, then there has to be some number c in that interval such that the derivative has that, or the derivative at that value of c is the same as the slope of the secant line that's created by the endpoints. Okay? So we're not saying that the endpoints are the same anymore. We're saying that now they may be different, and they're creating a line, right? That secant line that goes through two points. All the mean value theorem says is that there will be some value in between A and B that also generates the same slope as that secant line, okay? What that looks like, I want to go to the, where it, the picture where it looks before we actually do it. It looks like this. If I say that here's an endpoint, here's an endpoint, the line that generated here, that secant line, has a certain slope. There has to be a point somewhere between here and here that generates that same or same uh, tangent slope. So if we have a secant slope, there has to be somewhere in there that has that same tangent slope, which means basically we have that first derivative equal to the slope. So what we have, first derivative equals slope, right? This is just y2 minus y1 x2 minus x1, right? That's just the straight definition of the slope of a secant line. So if we're given 5 minus 4 over x, we want to find all the values in C that give us this value. So we want to say, where do f prime of C equal f4 minus f1 over 4 minus 1? So if we plug in 4, 4 over 4 is 1, 5 minus 1 is 4. I plug in 1, 5 minus 4 over 1 is 1. So we get 4 minus 1 gives us 3. 4 minus 1 equals 3. So we get that slope is 1. So by the mean value theorem, there has to be some place where the first derivative equals 1. So we just take the first derivative and set it equal to 1 and solve for that x value. All right, so if we take the first derivative, the first derivative of, what was our function? 5 minus 4 over x. So that's like negative 4x to the negative 1. So multiply negative 1 times negative gives us a positive, decrease by 1. So we wind up with 4 over x squared. So there has to be somewhere where 4 over x squared, which is the derivative, equals 1. So multiply both sides by x squared take the square root of both sides, you get x equals plus or minus 2. So not only do we get one value, we actually got two values where this happens. However, we're only talking about the interval from 1 to 4. 
So which one of these satisfies that? Positive 2, right? Negative 2 doesn't satisfy that. So on our picture, we can see that at x equals 2, we get the same secant line, or the same, in this case, tangent line, as we got that secant line through the endpoints. When will we use this? I'm not going to lie to you. I, don't, I couldn't even give you a time when we use this. But it's important to recognize that it happens mathematically. It's kind of just some of the theory that we have to learn. Okay? And it's not super challenging to take a derivative and set it equal to some value. And that's basically all you're doing. Take the derivative, set it equal to something. Okay? With Rolle's theorem, we were setting it equal to zero to guarantee a point of horizontal tangency or a peak or valley. Here we're just setting it equal to some other value. It doesn't matter what value we set it equal to. Uh, we can always solve it. Okay? Does that make sense? It's just a little bit of math. There is an alternate form of the uh, mean value theorem where we just rearrange everything. Uh, and it looks like f of b equals f a plus b minus a f prime c. The thing about this is this is point slope form. If we move this over here, we have y minus y1 equals m, right, slope, times x minus x1. It's just point slope form. So we have all these different forms that are basically the exact same thing, but no big deal. Now notice last sentence here. Keep in mind polynomials, rationals, and trig functions are always differentiable at all points in their domain. It's important to recognize that because we require differentiability for mean value and Rolle's theorem. Okay? All right. Any questions on Rolle's theorem and mean value? Think quick. That, the homework shouldn't be super challenging on that at all. Okay? As long as you can take derivatives, you should be able to set it equal to something. Now, increasing and decreasing functions in the first derivative test. This is where we actually get into an important uh, application of taking derivatives. So we want to first determine intervals where a function is increasing or decreasing. And we want to apply the first derivative test to find relative extrema of a function. Okay, So we're talking about using the first derivative test to find maximum and minimum values. So increasing and decreasing. Now we're going to learn how do we use derivatives to classify relative extrema as maximum or minimum. First, what we have to do is talk about the definitions of increasing and decreasing. This is going to be important. Graphically, it's easy to see when a function is increasing, right? If we look from left to right, if it has a lower point on the left than it does on the right, then it's increasing, right? Converse is also true. If it starts high and goes low, that means it's decreasing. It's easy to see that in a picture. Mathematically, basically what you're saying is if this x value is smaller than this x value, if the y value associated with this x is smaller than the y value associated with this x, it's increasing. Make sense? Also, if the x value here, if the y value is higher, then the y value associated with this x value, then it's decreasing. All right? That's really all that this says. Okay? Function is increasing when, if we're moving from left to right, the graph of it is going up. Its y value is going up. So if we look at this function here, from negative infinity to here, if we're coming from x, we can see that this graph is always going to be going down, right? From anywhere I pick to the left to this point. And then from here to here, it's not increasing or decreasing. So if x1 and, y, uh, x1 and x2 give us the same y values, then that's a constant function, okay? And then from here to positive infinity, it'll always be increasing. You can see it graphically. It's important to recognize that just like with domain, and it's important for, this should have 
arrows on it, right? Just like with domain, when we're talking about when we come to an arrow, I always call them inferos because they always mean they're going somewhere towards infinity. So if this is going here, that means it's going up to infinity, but it's also going left to infinity, right? Same way with this one. It's going up to infinity, but it's also going right to infinity. So make sure you're aware of what those arrows mean. All right, so the test for increasing and decreasing functions. Let's look at these functions here. If this function is decreasing on the left-hand side, right, if I pick a point and I draw that horizontal tangent line, what direction is that line going from left to right? It's going down. No matter where I draw my horizontal tangent line, if the function is decreasing, that horizontal tangent line is always going down, right? And the horizontal, or not the horizontal, the tangent line is always going down. And if the tangent line is going down, that means that its slope is what? It's negative, okay? And if its slope is negative, that means that the first derivative has to be a negative number because the first derivative is just the slope. So this is what we're going to see. Decreasing functions always have a negative slope. Increasing functions, the derivative is always positive because they have positive slopes for those horizontal, or uh, I keep wanting to say horizontal tangent lines, just tangent lines. So we can now define this by saying if the first derivative is positive for all of the x's in some interval, then that function has to be increasing on that interval. If the first derivative is negative, less than zero for all the x's in the interval, then that function has to be decreasing on that interval. And then lastly, if the first derivative is equal to zero, that means we have to have constant on that interval. Okay? So this is going to be the heart of what we call the first derivative test. So let's start by looking at a function and finding the open intervals because let me ask you a question. What's going on at this point and this point? Can we say that that point is increasing or decreasing? No, it's not doing anything. It's just kind of sitting there. So we can't ever have our endpoints be included in increasing and decreasing. So our, our intervals will always be open intervals when we talk about increasing and decreasing. Because at that point, to be decreasing then it has to be higher on this side and lower on this side. But here, it's higher over here, but it's the same over here. So I can't define that point as being increasing or decreasing. Same as here. So none of those points, so we always have to talk about an open interval. So find the open intervals where x cubed minus 3 halves x squared is increasing or decreasing. So the first thing we have to do, find the first derivative, right? From here on out, just about always the first thing that we're going to have to do is find a derivative. So, what's the derivative of x cubed? 3x squared, what's the derivative of negative 3 halves x squared? Negative 3x. Alright, so, 3x squared minus 3x. Now, we've got to determine where is that positive, where is that negative, and how do we do that? Well, to determine first any critical numbers because we know that critical numbers give us maxes and mins, right? And maximums and minimums are where we change from increasing to decreasing, right? Because if we go to a, a maximum, that means we were increasing and then we were decreasing. Or if we go to a minimum, that means we were decreasing and then we were increasing. So we start by finding critical numbers. We find critical numbers by setting the first derivative equal to zero. So we do 3x squared minus 3x equals zero. How do we solve that? Factor it? What are we going to pull out the 3x? So we got 3x times x minus 1 equals 0. So that's going to give us the fact that x equals 0 and x equals 1. Those are going to be our critical numbers. So now that we have critical numbers, 
what we're going to do is we're going to set up intervals. We're going to talk about, and I'm going to do this by hand because it, to me it's easier to, to visualize than, than the table is. We're going to set up a number line. You know, I've got to remember doing number lines in, in 112 where we had to determine whether uh, rational functions were positive or negative and we had to pick test points in those intervals, that sort of thing. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to say 0, 1, and I know I've got negative infinity over here and I've got positive infinity over here. So I need to pick a point between negative infinity and 0. Can I, anybody want to give me one? Between negative infinity and zero? Negative one. All right, what about a number between zero and one? Half? And then a number bigger than one? Two. Now what we're going to do is we're going to plug these test points into our factored form and find out whether we get a positive or a negative number. It doesn't matter what the number is. I'm more concerned with the sign of the number. Okay? So, 3 times negative 1 times negative 1 minus 1, which is negative 2. So a positive times a negative times a negative. Is that positive or negative? That's positive. All right, if we plug in 0.5, we get 3 times 0.5 times 0.5 minus 1, which is negative 0.5. So we got a positive times a positive times a negative. That's negative, right? And then when we plug in 2, 3 times 2 times 2 minus 1, which is 1, positive, 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 means positive. Okay. You do, but it's easier to use this form because it's already in factored form. I mean, you can plug it into this, but it, to me it's not as easy to see because I don't care about the number itself. I just care about the signs. It does it, Like I said, it doesn't matter which version you plug it into, but it does have to be the first derivative because this is what we're going to call the first derivative test, so you do use the first derivative. So if we're increasing from negative infinity to zero, open interval, and from one to infinity, okay? Does everybody see that? That's where we're increasing. It's where we have a positive first derivative, from negative infinity to zero, and then from one to positive infinity. That's increasing. And then decreasing would be from 0 to 1. And you see, the way they did it, they made a little table, which, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing a little table, but you've got the interval from negative infinity to 0, from 0 to 1, and from 1 to infinity. I just think it's easier to grasp when you see it on the number line and you can pick your test point. I just like that method better. You still get the same answer. It's always increasing, always decreasing, always increasing. But by doing it with this method, you already have the intervals set up before you get started. So you, uh. And this is what that graph looks like. We knew that it was going to be this kind of S shape because, well, we know it's a cubic, and that's the basic shape of a cubic rising from the left to the right. But we're showed that it's increasing to this point, decreasing, and then increasing. So we had a maximum here and a minimum here. Now how do we know, without looking at the graph, how do I know that this point was a point of a relative maximum? Well, I have two critical points. One's max and one's a min. How do I tell which one's which? without seeing the graph. Look at this. I'm increasing here 
decreasing here. That has to be a maximum, right? I'm decreasing here and then increasing here. That has to be a minimum. So you can tell by those intervals and where we're increasing and where we're decreasing as to whether we're generating a maximum or a minimum. So we were increasing, then we were decreasing, then we were increasing. So max, min. Okay? This becomes important because we're going to actually start with these functions and graph them. So to be able to graph, we need to know, are we generating a maximum? Are we generating a minimum? And it, some of this will kind of work itself out. You'll be like, well, I'm increasing to here, and then I'm going down. Well, that has to be a maximum. I mean, you don't have to know that in your head. You can start graphing it, and you'll see it. Here are guidelines. This is a handy little table. If we let f be a continuous function on the interval from a to b, to find the open intervals where it's increasing or decreasing, we start by finding the critical numbers and use these critical numbers to generate these test intervals, right? Once we've got our intervals, we determine the sign of the first derivative at a test value in each interval. And it doesn't matter which point you use in the interval, they're all going to give you the same sign, okay? Lastly, we're going to determine whether f is increasing or decreasing on each interval by determining whether it's positive or negative at that value. These guidelines are also valid when the interval from A to B is replaced by an interval in the form of negative infinity to B, A to infinity, or negative infinity to infinity. So it doesn't matter what our normal interval from A to B is. Most of the time, we're talking about negative infinity to positive infinity. We're talking about the entire real number line, right? Because we're graphing the entire function. But sometimes they may specifically give you from 2 to infinity or from negative infinity to 8, you know, so that they can restrict the domain. And it's still, all these are still going to be valid. A function is strictly monotonic. Monotonic means uh, increasing on the entire number line, not, monotonic just means increasing, basically. We're talking about strictly monotonic being when it's, uh, hold on, monotonic means it's either increasing or decreasing from left to right. So it starts here, ends here, it increased, therefore it's monotonically increasing. Strictly monotonic means that it never deviates from that. It's always increasing or always decreasing. I have no turns or anything in the middle. Okay, I can say that a, a function is increasing monotonically if it starts low and ends high, but it's got a bunch of relative maxes and mins inside of it. If it's strictly monotonic, then it has to be increasing constantly. I can have no peaks and valleys inside of it. Okay. Notice this function is increasing all the way to here and then increasing from here to here. There's no place where it starts decreasing. It levels off a little bit, and it looks like it may be constant, but it's not. This cubic function does not have a constant por portion there. It looks like it, but if you were to zoom in, you would see that it was always increasing just a little bit. And that's a strictly monotonic function. Now this function they tell you specifically that from 0 to 1, it is constant. It has the value of 0. So here, we're increasing, constant, increasing. This is not strictly monotonic because it has a portion that is not increasing, that's constant. Okay. So why do we learn all this? First derivative test, which is what we just did. So once we have these intervals, on which the function is increasing or decreasing, it's not difficult to locate the relative extreme of the function. So we're talking about when it's increasing and then decreasing, that's a relative maximum. When it's decreasing and then increasing, that's a relative minimum. I, just, I showed you on the thing how you can write this on your number line and you can see whether it's increasing or decreasing to a maximum or a minimum. That is the first derivative test. It's just determining whether it's a maximum or a minimum. We've done everything We've shown 
every step to this point. The last step is just verifying since it's increasing, increasing and then decreasing, that has to be a maximum. Or if it's decreasing, then increasing, that has to be a minimum. Right? So the first derivative test, all it says is if the first derivative changes from negative to positive, or from decreasing to increasing, that, that has to be a, a relative minimum. If the derivative changes from positive to negative at some value c, then that has to be a maximum because we're going from increasing to decreasing. And then lastly, if it's positive on both sides or negative on both sides, then it's neither relative, maximum, or minimum. It has to change. So if I do my first derivative test, I have a critical point, and it's negative on this side and negative on this side. Do I have a relative maximum or minimum? No, because it didn't change. It has to change. Increase to decrease gives me a max. Decrease to increase gives me a min. But decrease to decrease doesn't give me anything, right? Or increase to increase. So that's the first derivative test. So now I, I can give you a function, and I can say, find the relative extrema of this function, 1 half x minus sine x, but only on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. So notice I restricted that domain. So only on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. Well, this is a polynomial and a trig function, so I know it's continuous and differentiable over the entire number line, particularly from 0 to 2 pi, so I know I can do everything that I've learned so far. So if I take the first derivative, what do I get? What's the first derivative of 1 half x? Just 1 half, and then what's the derivative of negative sine x? Positive or negative? Be negative because of the minus sign, because the derivative of sine is already cosine. So, so we get one half minus cosine x. So we have to set this equal to zero, because that's the first derivative, and that's what we do. We set the first derivative equal to zero. So when I set that equal to zero, I get one half minus cosine x equals zero. All right. So I just move the cosine over. I get cosine equals one half. So on the interval from 0 to 2 pi, and this is why we like to do those intervals when we're using trig functions so that I don't have to do the plus 2 pi n kind of deal. Where on my unit circle does cosine x equal 1 half? Pi over 6? Pi over 3. If you can't remember, remember, you know you've got... 1 half, square root of 3 over 2, and square root of 2 over 2. Those are like the three values that you get, right? Remember, the x value is the cosine, and the y is the sine. So if I'm looking for where cosine is 1 half, think about your number line. That means x is 1 half, y has to be root 3 over 2. That's a much higher value than if you got root 3 over 2 and 1 half. So this is 1 half root 3 over 2. This is root 3 over 2, 1 half. So this is pi over 6, and this is pi over 3, right? So we know cosine is 1 half at pi over 3. Is there anywhere else that cosine equals pi over, or cosine equals 1 half? What about that? Yeah, 5 pi over 3. So, if you're not savvy on your unit circle, let's go back to that unit circle. If you need a copy of it, actually I'll post one in Blackboard under Documents. So, make sure you're up on how to read your unit circle and how to draw one if you need it. Okay? So, I get that x now is equal to pi over 3 or 5 pi over 3. These are our critical numbers. So I'm going to set up my test intervals. I know that the derivative exists everywhere. It's not undefined because remember that we have that condition that says our critical numbers are anywhere that the first derivative is equal to 0 or anywhere that the first derivative is undefined. Since there's nowhere it's undefined, these are going to be our only critical numbers. So we set up our test interval. Let's do it my way, too. So we've got 
Ooh. So we got power over three, five power over three. So we're going from zero to two pi, right? That's our interval. So give me a value between zero and pi over three. No, pi over two is higher than pi over three. What about pi over four? Think about your unit circle and where pi over three is. Pi over four, pi over six are both smaller than that, right? So we're going to use pi over four. And a number between pi over three and five pi over three? That would be pi over two. I can use pi over two. I can use pi. I can use three pi over two. I mean, there's a lot of values in there. Let's use pi over two, because it won't matter. And then a number between five pi over three and two pi, how about seven pi over four? Another reason to make sure you know your unit circle is because you're going to need it for doing test points, knowing what values are between what values, right? So if I plug in pi over four into my first derivative, one half minus cosine x. So one half minus cosine of pi over four. So that's one half minus square root of two over two. Is that a positive number or a negative number? It's got to be a negative number, right? Because root two is bigger than one. So one minus a number bigger than itself is negative. So this gives me a negative value. So I'm decreasing on that interval. If I plug in pi over two, one half minus cosine pi over two. So what's cosine of pi over two? Zero. So we have one half minus zero. Is that positive or negative? That's positive. And then one half minus cosine of seven pi over four. Cosine of seven pi over four is root two over two again. So one half minus root two over two. Same thing we had on that first interval, still negative. So we can see that on the first interval, we're decreasing. Second interval, we're increasing. Third interval, we're decreasing again. So that means we've got decreasing to increasing, which means we have a minimum at pi over 3. And then we're increasing to decreasing, which means we have a maximum at 5 pi over 3. Ignoring the trig on this, which may be giving you a hiccup just because we haven't done it in a minute, does the, does the calculus make sense? Do you see what I'm doing, finding the test point, making sure we plug it in? That's the part I want to make sure that you're getting right now. The, the uh, trig you can look back over, but as long as we understand the calculus part, that's, that's what's really important right here. So when you graph that, you see that this is what it looks like. Which makes sense. If you know how to graph it. Which that's a little bit of a complicated graph, but... All right, questions on that? All right, let's look at a worksheet here. So notice that the directions say start by finding the critical points and any discontinuities and then find the open intervals where it's increasing or decreasing. 
we're talking now about concavity and the second derivative test. So we've done the first derivative test. Now we want to talk about the second derivative test. In this section, we are going to determine intervals on where the uh, function is concave up and concave down. We're going to find points of inflection, and we're going to apply the second derivative test to find relative extrema. So remember, the first derivative test was to find relative extrema as well. We're going to have a second derivative test that also does this. So concavity. What is concavity? We've seen that locating intervals in which a function is increasing or decreasing can help describe what the graph looks like. But it, don't, it only takes you so far. This section, when we talk about concavity, is going to help you find where the first derivative is increasing or decreasing. And this is going to help us to determine whether the graph is curving up or curving down. Okay, So we can get our graph shaped a little bit better. That was one of the problems with graphing in 112. We only had specific points, and we had some general guidelines and, and ways to sketch, but we didn't have really good methods of finding where these things were specifically curved and that sort of thing. So that's what we're going to use. We're going to use concavity. So if we let f be some differentiable function on an open interval, then the graph is concave up when the first derivative is increasing. It's concave down when the second derivative or when the first derivative is decreasing. Okay. Now, what does that look like, concave up and concave down? So notice, if the first derivative is increasing, then we have something called concave up. Notice, I'm not saying is f prime, the first derivative, is it positive or negative? I don't care about that. What I care about is whether it's increasing or decreasing. So notice here. It's negative here, right? Here it's positive. Here it's positive, but it's more sloped, right? So it's a bigger value. So we started with a negative and we go positive. So I can see that my first derivative is increasing, okay? And this creates concave up, which is a bowl shape. So if we have some kind of bowl shape, we call that concave up, okay? Notice here, I start with a positive slope, and it gets less sloped, and then it goes negative slope. So our first derivative is decreasing. This gives us an upside-down bowl, which we call concave down. Okay. So to find open intervals on where the fu uh, function is concave up or concave down, we first have to find the intervals where it's increasing and decreasing. So how do we find? How do we determine whether a function is increasing or decreasing? We just did it, right? First derivative test. Now, I don't want to tell whether the function is increasing. I want to know whether the derivative is increasing. So if I have to take a derivative to find increasing or decreasing, then that just means I need to take the derivative of the derivative or the second derivative. So if the second derivative is positive, that means that the first derivative is increasing. The second derivative is negative. That means the first derivative is decreasing. Okay, does that make sense? Take this function, differentiate it. It tells whether this function is increasing or decreasing. But now I've got this function. I want to know whether this function is increasing or decreasing. So I need to take the derivative again, and that's going to tell me whether the new one, which was the first derivative, is increasing or decreasing. So we're just now instead of taking the first derivative, we're taking the second derivative. Okay. So. For instance, notice here, we've got 1 third x cubed minus x. If we take the first derivative, we get x squared minus 1. We need to know, is it increasing or decreasing on an interval? So to determine whether this is increasing or decreasing on an interval, we would say 2x equals 0. Where does 2x equal 0? It's not a trick x equals 0, 2x equals 0, then x has to be 0. So that tells us that at x equals 0 is a critical point to determine whether the derivative is increasing or decreasing. So I can look at and determine that. Now, that graph, we can see that it's concave down on this interval, 
it's concave up on this interval. That x equals zero that we solved for here is where it changes from concave up to concave down. Now you can see these two graphs. This is the graph of the first derivative. And we can see that the first derivative has a minimum here. But that minimum is going to generate something completely different on the original graph. So a lot of times I hesitate to even show these two graphs together, but it's, it's beneficial, I think, to see that this is the graph of the derivative of this function. And I can determine the maximum and minimums of this graph which are actually going to give us something called points of inflection on the other graph, which is where we change from concave up to concave down or from concave down to concave up. So what we're saying is if the second derivative is positive, then the graph is concave up. If the second derivative is negative, then it's concave down on that interval. So to apply this theorem, we're going to locate the x values where the second derivative equals 0. We're going to set test values. Do just like we did with the first derivative test. We're just using the second derivative. Okay. So determine the open intervals on which the graph of 6 over x squared plus 3 is concave up or concave down. So the first thing we have to do is what? Find what? Find the derivative. It's always going to be the first thing we have to do. Now, there are multiple ways of doing this, but a really easy method, instead of trying to do low d high minus high d low over low low because it's a quotient, is to rewrite it as 6 times x squared plus 3 to the negative 1. That way we can use chain rule on it. Okay? So we're going to rewrite it, then we're going to use the chain rule. So negative 1 times 6 gives us negative 6. x squared plus 3 decreased by 1, so that gives negative 2. And then take the derivative of what's in the parentheses, which is going to give us 2x on the end. So we wind up with this, which we can see is just negative 12x over x squared plus 3 squared. Don't wear two pairs of glasses. It makes your ears hurt. I sitting there going, I kept adjusting these going, it's not helping any. It's because that other pair was pressing on some kind of nerve. All right. So now we have the first derivative. So if we have a first derivative, to find concavity, we need to find the second derivative. So now we can do low d high, high d low over low low, right? So we do low x squared plus 3 squared d high. Derivative of negative 12x is negative 12. Minus high negative 12x d low. Bring the 2 out front, rewrite, decrease by 1, and then the derivative of x squared plus 3 is 2x. All over low low. So x squared plus 3 squared squared is x squared plus 3 to the fourth. So when we clean this up, right, we distribute the negative 12 through, we multiply and distribute all this through, it's going to clean up to be 36 times x squared minus 1 over x squared plus 3 cubed. That's a huge leap. So this would be negative 12x squared. Oh, you can't do that. Negative 12 times x squared plus 3 squared. Then you've got negative, negative is positive, 48x times x squared plus 3. There's an x squared plus 3 in both of those, so you can factor out an x squared plus 3. It leaves you with negative 12 times x squared plus 3 plus 48x. So when you distribute that through, you get x squared plus 3, negative 12x cubed 
minus 36 plus negative 12x squared plus 48x squared. That's a squared. That's a squared. So you get x squared plus 3 times 36x squared minus 36. The x squared plus 3, one of them will cancel out. Leaves you with just 36 times x squared minus 1. And that's where that's from. So, if that's our second derivative, we got to ask, well, where does that equal 0? Because that's what we've got to find, right? We've got to find those critical uh, points. So, the only place that this can equal 0 is when the numerator equals 0, right? That's kind of the definition of a rational expression. Rational expression only equals 0 if the numerator equals 0. So that only happens when x squared minus 1 equals 0, which means x is equal to plus or minus 1. So since it's defined on the entire line, we have to test those three intervals created by negative infinity to negative 1, negative 1 to 1, and 1 to positive infinity. So when you do this, if you plug in negative 2, negative 2 squared is 4, 4 minus 1 is 3, 3 times 36 is a positive number. Negative 2 squared is positive, plus positive is positive, positive cubed is positive, positive divided by positive is all positive. So that tells us that here we're positive, which means we're concave up. If we pick x equals 0, 0 minus 1 is negative, it means we have a negative on the top. 0 plus 3 is positive, so we've got a negative over a positive, which means we have a negative, which means we're concave down on that interval. And then we plug in 2. 4 minus 1 is 3 is positive on the top, positive on the bottom. Positive divided by positive is positive, therefore it's concave up on that interval. This is the graph of 6 over x squared plus 3. So from here, we're concave up because it's like a bowl. Here to here, it's like an upside down bowl, so it's concave down. Here it switches over to being like a regular bowl. So on that interval, it's concave up. You can't see what's going on, you know, that looks like this. Because we don't know what it's doing over there, but we do know that it's going to be concave up on this entire interval. This will be concave up on this entire interval. Okay? So the function was continuous over the entire number line. When there are x values at which the function is not continuous, these values should be used along with the points second derivative equals 0 or, f, uh, or second derivative does not exist to form the test interval. So if you wind up with some function, when you take the derivative, where the denominator is equal to 0, that's going to be an undefined point, right? If the original function has the same point undefined, it's not a critical number. It's only a critical number if it's defined in the original, but not defined in the first or second derivative. Okay? But that's important to recognize that it doesn't happen often, but it does happen that you might have an undefined point in your first or second derivative. And only when that is not in the original does that count as a critical number. All right. I'm going to go ahead and cut it off right there because I've thrown a lot of stuff at you. Uh, we'll start with points of inflection tomorrow and finish up uh, four, 3, 4, 3, 5, and 3, 6. So it will help if you do this, you know, get in there, work on this homework. That way, if you have any questions about it as you're doing it, you can get with me. Uh, this is all just intellectual until you start actually trying to work it yourself, okay? When you get in there and start working, if you've got any problems, please let me know as soon as you have problems, okay? Send me a reminder. I'll get back to you as soon as I can because this stuff is coming at you fast, so I want to make sure that we kind of have this in our heads, okay? So if anybody has any questions, 
feel free to stay and ask. Otherwise, we will see you in the morning.